You were listening to the Never Meet Your Heroes podcast, conversations with artists about their work and inspiration. I am your host, Anthony Moses Sanchez. Welcome to another episode of Never Meet Your Heroes podcast. And on today's episode, we have Ian McKinnon. Uh, so Ian, we'll start with having you uh, introduce yourself and let everybody know where you're from and how you got into your art. Sure. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm Ian McKinnon. I'm from a suburb of Madison, Wisconsin called Monona. And how did I get into my art? Yeah. or did, Well, it's also fun to hear about like what was your life in Wisconsin before you became the wonderful, fabulous gay guy that you are today? <laughs> well, um, I guess I was just a wonderful, fabulous little gay kid, uh-huh. little gay baby in Monona. But like not having such a wonderful, fabulous time there all the time Mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, I guess, I mean, in a way, a lot of, like, I started performing when I was little. Um, There was a woman who had, like, a a neighborhood, you know, group for kids who would, you know, do, like, Alibaba and The Little Match Girl and, you know, little stories like that, Grinch Who Stole Christmas. And so I started doing that. was really musical as a kid. Mm -hmm. Always, you know, trying to organize kids to put on a show or, um, you know, play creative games and stuff like that. That's fun. That's awesome. Yeah. Did there happen to ever be any, any video or film of you performing as a little kid? There must be that somewhere there is. Yeah. The way the, these, these people I knew who were my friends down the street had like a beta video recorder. Okay. And so there's somewhere there's like probably a beta tape of this show we did called the castle in the jungle. Oh, right. Which is the nice. first play I wrote at like, I don't know how old I was. We were, little. <laughs> it was cute. It was I fun. I love it. Yeah. How did you, so you are kind of a multi hyphenate artist. So do you primarily consider yourself a performance artist? And then how did you get in to set? Uh, yeah, I guess I consider myself a performance artist. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I did theater. I have a theater background and, mm. and, uh, did that in undergrad and then in school discovered performance art as a medium Mm -hmm. and thought, oh, this is great. It's so creatively limitless and it can be about gay liberation and it can be about, you know, the personal's political thought, oh my gosh, you know, I want to express myself this way rather than just, you know, saying other people's lines and, Mm -hmm. you know, doing what the director says, which I always had a little trouble with. Um, I would create my own work, you know, and have it be about gay liberation and and, uh, personal development. So how did your interest then in performance art, you must have decided, did you decide during your undergrad that you were going to pursue theater? Yeah. Well, I was, yeah. I mean, I was getting a degree in acting in undergrad. Yeah. So that was decided, you know, before. And then, but then like junior year, I was Mm -hmm. like, oh shit, you know, I could do performance art found the works of Tim Miller and Holly Hughes, John Fleck, the, you know, the NEA four, Karen Finley also, but specifically Holly and Tim's work really, um, attractive and Mm -hmm. really spoke to me and inspired me a lot. And I ended up seeing Tim perform, uh, and connecting with him and then just, you know, feeling so inspired. And then I got like a summer stock job in Santa Maria okay. doing like musical theater for the summer, like post-college. All right. And Tim was like, oh, you should come to LA and there's a scene for performance art. And I was already in Santa Maria. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'll, you know, I'll come to LA. I'll give it, I'll try it out. I'll see what the scene's like. Where was, where did you go to college then? Or what city at least? It was in Dallas, Texas. I went to Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Wow. Yeah. So Wisconsin to (laughs) Dallas. Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) And then you ended up in, when you came to Santa Maria, is that when you started thinking about coming out to LA? Well, I had met him and he, already I had been thinking about it. Okay. But when I got that job, yeah. And I, I, uh, it just seemed like it made sense. You know, it was just like down the road. You talked a little bit about gay liberation, too, so I don't want to move away from that yet. How would you describe how you got into that or aware of that? Was that in college? Oh, no. You know, I I don't know. How old was I? I must have been like when I was the summer before high school, I picked up an interview magazine and there was an article about Stonewall in it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? No one told me that there was a gay, there's a gay liberation movement. (laughs) I I know I had no idea. Yeah. You know, I just was so isolated in Wisconsin and you know, there's no Mm -hmm. internet at the time when I was a kid. And um, well, there was, but it was like, you know, you plugged into the phone, you know, you took the phone line out, you know, that I became aware of gay liberation, I guess at that point and that there was a movement and then, yeah, but then it wasn't until like I came out maybe at the end of high school and in the beginning of college that it sort of grow in me more. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized you could put 
the art in service of gay liberation, it just really clicked for me. You know, I was at a point wanting to work with my own issues and and come out more and, you know, claim a gay identity and explore that and understand that. Um, now here was this like creative medium that was like perfect right. for it. Something that I wanted to talk about a little later, but we can bring it up now is, you know, you host Queer Mondays, which is here in LA. It's been at Akbar for what, like oh, yeah. five? Well, well, Queer Mondays was at Highways. Oh, it was a Highways before. Uh, initially, yeah. Oh, right. For like three and a half years. And then it then sort of morphed into Planet Queer, which okay. is at Akbar. And oh, has, there we go. I think we're like in our sixth year okay. of doing that. Yeah. But I do feel like people can gravitate there once they find that scene still here in L.A. Whereas with gay liberation, your performance art, it kind of makes sense that you would be involved in that. Like that would be a passion. Am I yeah. right putting that? Oh, totally a passion. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just like to support queer creativity. I think it's important. I think it's really necessary for mm -hmm. the world. And, you know, just, you know, to, that artists, you know, create the visions and can be ones that help move ideas forward and, mm -hmm. and um, present new ideas and that the world just really needs queer visions. And yeah, when we started Queer Mondays, there was a group of us doing shows now and then. I was curating like gay men's nights before that. Yeah. But it was like inconsistent. So it was like, oh, we got to do a monthly thing we need like a consistent platform where queer people can like come and work right. on their art and get better and mm. cultivate their visions and um yeah i guess i'm connecting it again to your interest earlier in your life and what you're doing now Oh, yeah. yeah. It's like a continuation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at Planet Queer as kind of like a creative queer liberation. Like it's, okay. it's like activism, like art as activism or mm -hmm. a show as activism. Like it, I eventually got to a point because I've done so many different types of performance mm -hmm. um, since I came to L.A. And I mean, it's always sort of had this liberationist intent, but some, you know, some didn't. And it just became more and more important mm -hmm. to me to have that as a framework for what we're doing, that it's like putting a, a bar show or like a narcissist yeah. fest or whatever people would call <laughs> things like that, you know, putting that in service of gay liberation, you right. know, or putting it in a context yeah. where that idea of like people expressing themselves is, is political, that these creative ideas can like vibrate out and empower people or inspire mm -hmm. them or somehow, you know, hopefully help the world. Let's talk about how when you got here to LA, then catch up to that dot of oh, yeah. you getting you getting into these other things. So you you get to Santa Maria, you decide some roughly that you're going to come to LA, uh -huh. and then what did that look like when you got here? Um, well, let's see, LA. I you know when I first came, I started to. I, well, I guess I did my first show at the Max 10 at mm -hmm. um, Electric Lodge in Venice. It was the first time they did that. And that was my first performance there. And so then I started to hang out around Highways okay. performance space in Santa Monica. Saw a lot of the shows there and started to take workshops there with Tim Miller and, you know, performing there s slowly. And... Yeah, it seemed to me that, that there had been like a really strong, vibrant scene there around ACT UP, oh, and around right. AIDS activism and stuff like in the late 80s and all through the 90s. I think Highways was like a real hot spot and like hub for that scene. But I came like around the millennium. So it was like changing. And Tim stepped down as the artistic director. Daniel Brazell stepped in. And um, so there was like a shift in energy and... I don't know. I think LA can be isolating too. So I wasn't like so networked exactly. Right. I felt sort of alone in what I was doing. Like I knew Hunter Lee Hughes was doing a, a solo gay show, Flight of the Monarchs. But yeah, so I just started kind of performing at highways, doing like mixed gay nights. Mm -hmm. um, then that slowly evolved into curating gay okay. nights on my own. And I did a boyfriend piece uh, with this this guy who was my boyfriend. And we toured that for a while. And that was kind of when, you know, we finally did like a full length and then took it around to San Francisco, New York. Then eventually we broke up. At the same time, I started to run this, like, we called it like a psychedelic glitter rock theater troupe called the Discount Cruise to Hell. Oh, yeah, uh, I remember that. Do you remember? Did you yeah. ever see that? I think I did. Oh, my God. Yeah, that that was fun. And, you know, and so that was like, a, in a way, I felt like a lot of, you know, just experimentation and, and playing. So we did that. It was sort of like a theater troupe slash band. And so I was running mm. that as well as then doing these gay men's night on the side. And then... As those both sort of came to a close, I felt like I want to do, you know, solo shows and I got inspired to do the gay histology pieces okay. and to perform about gay history. And then that's also when Queer Mondays was born. I was like, oh, I want to take, you know, like this group work that I've been doing and like collaborating with other queer artists and empowering them and, and providing a platform, 
you know, have it be monthly and consistent. And so that held that kind of energy. And then I, yeah, then I started doing these gay history projects. Okay. Well, let's come back to the gay history, but I, you keep bringing up Tim Miller. And oh, I yeah. am I am unaware of who this is and probably some of the other oh. listeners would be. So how would you describe what, what he's done in the past and... Tim's like the Walt Whitman of performance art or something. He's like um, a Johnny Appleseed of performance. He's like this major force. Um, like back in, do you remember when Maplethorpe got defunded and the NEA defunded all these artists? I might have not been as connected. I might have been closet gay boy in my own suburbs here in LA right. and not known. I know that there were defunding of a lot of things. Yeah. What particular work did Maplethorpe get defunded from? Do you I don't even know if it's I, relevant. I don't this. know. Is it the one where he's like got the whip stuck up his ass? Probably. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's his best photograph, I think. So they can defund him for that. But um, Tim had a piece called My Queer Body. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, he was defunded. And then they sued the federal government. And I think they won. And anyway, he had sort of launched him into into fame and he Tim is great he like tours all sorts of universities mm-hmm. um, leading workshops inspiring queer kids to get into performance art okay. which is totally what he did for me mm-hmm. I mean first writing his work mm-hmm. or reading his written work then meeting him and experiencing his workshops and stuff like that was okay. like definitely one of my big mentors and guides and and uh, he's he's wonderful. It was so you know, it was just so empowering, especially as a young isolated gay boy, like what you're talking about. Yeah. To see this man take the stage and like just claim his queerness in such a fierce, empowered way, and sexual, and you know, political combining, you know, mm-hmm. with sort of this you know this gay uplifting fun feeling. It's just um, yeah, he's wonderful. Tim sounds pretty cool. I'm gonna have to look him up after. Oh, this, definitely. Yeah, sure. he's great. So getting into, I guess, gay historgy, because you mentioned that that was kind Uh of like your your trajectory. That piece, you had like three parts? There's a fourth part. It's kind of, yeah, it has multiple parts. How would you describe that to people? Like the concept that that how I would describe it is you you go through a time machine and kind of have sex with all the different people that you're you're inspired (laughs) by or you're, uh, is that right? Like it's a time machine? (laughs) yeah. That's pretty accurate. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, it's as if, right, I time travel and meet different gay icons. Uh-huh. Yeah, and seduce them or have love scenes with them or, I mean, it's basically, yeah, like a gay history lecture, but disguised as, as performance art. Um, but yeah, that was the concept, right, that I had a fetish for gay history <laughs> <laughs> and and that this was, you know, part of my my adventure. Do you do you feel like when you're especially with gay historgy like that that is a character that you're playing when you're doing that because well yeah I definitely have like a so stage much. persona mm-hmm. yeah it's like an exploded version <laughs> of myself or something you know okay like uh, yeah there's definitely like a stage persona that kicks in for sure how did how did it come about then like was there a particular character not even characters right there historic person that you were just like wow like this person's really hot or yeah totally how did you get to there yeah it was that um i had read that there was a man named carl ulrichs who was called the grandfather of gay rights and i was like Mm -hmm. what i didn't again no one told me right and um so i was like oh i should look him up i should read you know his ideas and see what he had to say Mm -hmm. and i was checking it out and i was like just got really turned on because it felt like what he was saying was still really relevant and still right. kind of hot. Mm-hmm. And I thought, man, if only guys talked like this now, mm. you know, um, in this like such an empowered way and such a way, you know, there's such a way that he claims his, his gayness as, as like God given and as intrinsic and as this, this natural, beautiful thing that is just, it was really inspiring. So I was like, I should do a, performance piece where he's my boyfriend okay and because he had all these you know fabulous quotations i was like oh i really want to communicate these this to people and share the way that i'm you know getting so turned on about it and so i tried out a short piece which was just a love scene with carl um because i was like you know gay history or just history is typically so dry and yeah and you know nothing below the belt or something in history right and so i thought let's see if this even works and it went really well Mm-hmm. And it was exciting. So I thought, oh I, oh, I could do this with like all sorts of different icons, you know, mm-hmm. across the globe and throughout time. And um, yeah, so that's what inspired it. Okay. I feel like gay history, I it's something of interest to me. So I, I didn't learn about it until college. So it didn't feel like a 
super big jump from or it was an easy sell to me, I guess. But I'm oh. sure to other people, it was like, what is this? <laughs> Did you get a lot of reaction from it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think mostly people. I mean, I guess you don't hear the criticism from people, but okay. I, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you know, people generally liked it. I think because it was yeah. it was pretty uplifting and fun and had this sex positive, gay affirmative queer or gay liberationist um, vibe to it, Mm -hmm. which is uplifting. And, but certainly, and you know, I dealt with this in the very first one, you know, that, that some people have a problem with claiming certain people in history as gay or as queer, you know, like based on like social constructionist theory or something like that, that you can't claim someone as gay um, before oh, the right. word was invented, right? When Oscar Wilde's trial was, I, I believe. Yeah, I feel was like the first time. Well, I know Carl. I think Carl Ulrich's co- called us Uranians. That right. was, the, and that was like maybe 1862 or something. And right. I feel like homosexuality isn't too far after that mm-hmm. because it it, took, it caught on a lot more. I think. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's fairly recent term. Yes. Yeah. Term. What do you? So then, how do you reckon with all these same sex loving people? You know, throughout history, and so that was kind of the crux of the drama of the first piece, mm-hmm. and so that would stir up, you know, some things from people like, oh, you can't say Plato's gay, or you can't oh. say, you know, Emperor I of the Han Dynasty is gay, or something. Right. Um, and I'm like, well, why not? Uh-huh. You know, I mean, they loved men too. If there was same sex love there, whether or not, you know, yeah, sure, it's not. You know, it's like both to me. Like, sure, the social construct of how we understand gay and queer now isn't wasn't then. Yeah. But I still am pretty sure, you know, that certain physiological things probably happen the same. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> you know, I think the and people love. that make that dis- distinction the most are like academics, totally, because, it, because totally. it's really important in their work. But because um, mm-hmm. I I've I've been in on, in on James Whale, the director, 1930s. Mm-hmm. I was watching the kind of extras and stuff and. Uh, horror filmed Clive Barker is gay. Yeah. And somebody was, tr- I guess he was trying to defend James Whale because people are saying James Whale's films are campy. But mm. it was predates, like, was it Sontang that said about campy or it's, it's, whoever invented oh. the word campy, it's hard to place it in the in that concept, right? Oh. It's similar to the homosexuality. Oh, like, interesting. We can't really call something campy when it predates when the concept of campy happened. But I feel mm. like gay men have probably, there's always been a set of gay men that have been campy. Just like there's always been a set of gay men who have maybe oh, tried to create yeah. a gay liberation or some kind yeah. of movement. I think those things go hand in hand to camp, gay camp and liberation. Like camp, it, I mean, you know, just the theater of the ridiculous is one right. of my favorite genres of theater. And I feel like, you know, Queer Mondays in a way exists in that sort of ex- exploded style that's you know very gay mm-hmm. and i love it i find i think it's so empowering but yeah i know there's such a debate so the stuff like that would come up you know mm-hmm. um but for me i just feel like you know a tree is a tree what we can call it what you want but the tree is still growing and that there's something eternal about gay soul and queer spirit um just you know from the dawn of humankind right um any anyone in particular besides who you mentioned with Historgy that that inspired you as well as you're, when you were doing your research? Anybody that you were just like, wow? Yeah, totally. I mean, so many. I mean, it, it's all, there's so many wows. But let's see, who else? Well, you know, I mean, an obvious one is Whitman. I mean, I also love um, Edward Carpenter. His ideas are so in, amazing. He's like, he he's sort of like a proto-hippie or like a pre-hippie. I think he introduced the sandal to like Britain and he was a vegetarian and he had this um, place called Millthorpe out on the British, in the British countryside that was sort of like a, I I guess you could call it like a hippie commune or something, but it was like a queer one. So sort of this like oasis for queer people to go to and um, he had this, you know, beautiful boyfriend and, but he's a great thinker. Um, so his ideas really turned me on, you know, ideas like, um, I think he believed that the Uranian people or gay people, queer people would lead the advanced guard of a new social movement okay. that would replace the cash nexus as mm-hmm. the organizing principle of society mm-hmm. and replace it with um, comradeship. That's something I really connect with. That is a beautiful utopia. Yeah, yeah, especially now when we're in like late stage capitalism. Right. Look at the mess. Look at the disgusting, yeah. reprehensible, destructive mess. Yeah. And that 
that's why I think queer visions are important and and like the symbols inside gay love of egalitarianism and the love of sames and the the way queer people organize and care for each other you know you could see that during the AIDS epidemic or you know that and that like if that was organizing society more I just think the world needs it well something that I've also aware of um you know being in Argentina Mm. And, you know, the economic collapse, um, you kind of see when cultures lose that cash independence that people have to rely on each other. And mm. and during that AIDS epidemic, I think the gay culture learned a lot about that. Yeah. No, nothing that we have the answer to spe- specifically. Right. But. I know we're getting lofty, <laughs> but I think there is like, you know, a great power in gayness and in queerness. Like even the fact that we were able to come out of the closet, like right. like we're born into hands of straight people mm-hmm. who see us as straight. Probably they're not looking at their baby thinking, right. oh, here's my lovely queer baby who I love. Mm-hmm. Um, no, we're getting like m- heterosexuality mirrored and reflected like our whole lives up and, you know. And so I just think that like it's so powerful to have a queer spirit because the whole world is saying like, you know, the meaning of life is to have babies and to get married and to buy, you know, purchase products or watch streaming channels or whatever it is. And there's like a you know, watch streaming channels about getting married and having babies, you know, like there's just so much heterosexual like inundation right. that like, it's amazing to me that, that the queer spirit or the gay soul like rises up and just says, no, yeah. I'm going to be me. And that we have this amazing allegiance to like our inner worlds and mm-hmm. our desire and our, our, you know, queer spirits and souls. So I think that's really hopeful for the world. It's as someone who's again doing the Queer Mondays, Planet, or Planet Queer, Queer sorry, yeah, Planet Queer. That's right. I was like, look at my. It, ha- it, it happens Queer. all the time. But the, <laughs> looking at Planet, being at Planet Queer, do, are you seeing a change in the young gays that are coming in, the lesbians, the trans, the queers, like in their perception of their self? Because now it's kind of like they can find their group. Oh yeah, the doors are wide open now. You know, for for personal expression and. Yeah, we see all sorts of of stuff. Um, it's so diverse at mm-hmm. at Planet Queer. I mean, you know, there are the artists, you know, the regulars that that I love and that of perform course. a lot, of course. But there's always people like moving in and out of the circle or coming through or different, you know, different scenes overlapping there. So I really like that about it. But have you noticed a difference in the? I don't know if you could tell from their performances. Like, are people still dealing with coming out in a, in the same way? That would be a one good oh. touchstone. You know, I no, I think that's different. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm just, just I've been bringing up coming out just because I think it's so amazing. Oh, right. That we can be so programmed and brainwashed mm-hmm. and then something inside just says no and breaks through that. That is power. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a cool queer power. I mean, in, in some ways I see people, I mean, people are like sort of fighting systemic issues. Right. Um, for sure. Um, and I think a lot of artists consciously or not, you know, are dealing with, you know, the fallout from having to grow up queer in a queer hating world or a queer repressing world, even though things are better, quote unquote, or more open and more access to resources and stuff. There's still, you know, internalized queer phobia and, um, issues like that, that some artists, especially spoken word artists and stuff are, are working with. Okay. But Planet Queer also has a real, like, sort of celebratory side. Okay. You know, things can be really, you know, we'll, we'll get dark and get real. And, and mm-hmm. I mean, people have done, you know, I've cried there. Um, but it also then has this, you know, that uplifting camp, glitter, confetti, yeah. um, bodies, body positive, sex positive work. Uh-huh. Yeah, it probably attracts more of, like, an extrovert kind of personality, too, I imagine. If you're saying it's mostly more li- uplifting and... Yeah, I mean, possibly. I that's a, that's a good question to know. Like, I wonder yeah. if the audience is more extroverted or introverted. I mean, yeah. I mean, this the show kind of fosters uh, like like I always do this queer activist workout at the mm. beginning, which is like to kind of it's like a crowd warmer upper, but it's also like to foster community. It gets people like touching a little bit, like they high five okay. each other, and you know, like I have some interactive things that do happen. And I guess sometimes I notice some people who are just not going to be able right. to do that. But usually, you know, you just get caught up in the energy. But, I, you know, it's real diverse. You know, there's musicians and, you know, we just did a show that was like for Halloween around the tarot. Right. And that, that brought out some heavy, heavy stuff. It can be, it can be a real mixture for sure. Of course. Yeah. Right. There's no way to predict as well with 
you know what people are going to bring because you're not you're not curating it like you did the other other works before, right? Right. It's more loosely curated. I mean, I know what people are going to do in their tech, and like I hear, uh, you know, pretty right. much what's going on. But yeah, I like it to just be open, like not up to you know, my authoritative taste or something <laughs> like that, you know? Right. Like to try to honor that egalitarian spirit of, of gayness and queerness. And also, I guess, you know, maybe to a fault, I sort of believe just that everyone is unique and what the hell, uh, uh, art is subjective. I mean, I can remember certainly after sh- some shows, people being like, oh my God, so-and-so, that was my favorite piece. And then you turn around okay. and someone's like, oh my God, that was horrible. I hated yeah. that piece. So I'm like, well, ugh, you know, yeah. I'm gonna I'm just gonna be open. Yeah. No, I think that's the rough part about art. When you start, you you kind of eventually have to realize how subjective it is. Totally. And it has to connect with who it's gonna connect with. Yeah. And sometimes you can't control that. Right. And I also agree with the saying what you saying about you don't want to be too authoritative. Because it feels very patriarchal, which is something that we're already living in totally. every day. Yeah. So it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you I understand what you. Yeah. I mean, I'm running the thing, and we're you know Travis Wood and I co-produce it, mm-hmm. um, but you know we put up the de- decorations and do that advertising and all of that work, but try to yeah have it be as like opening and welcoming a space as possible and a warm space. You know, so many bar events can feel cold or you know clicky or pretentious, and okay. I hope that we cultivate a warm, open atmosphere well akbar is a great space though that's, oh, it has a wonderful Akbar. history too yeah. and yeah. it just has this vibe uh, every time i go in there it's always felt homey oh that's good so yeah. um, they've been so great to us too mm-hmm. and letting us do it there um has there been any other performance stuff that's going on there yeah you know sometimes it feels like akbar is like an unofficial queer cultural center yeah <laughs> um because yeah especially when planet queer first started there was so, it was like suddenly so much it felt like there was like a show every night uh-huh. there but yeah they do the queer crafting and um i think they have a ukulele player on sundays and there's so much probably a good time to bring up the gentrification of silver like what has that affected the different things that have been going on there because I know everyone talks about the hipsters, positive or negative, but oh, it's, yeah. it's changed the culture a little bit. Like, um, well, maybe a good example is Circus of Books finally closed, right? Oh, I know. That's too bad. Yeah, I mean, ugh, Silver Lake has completely changed. Like, Le Barcito is gone right. and The Other Side and MJ's. And, yeah, there was, like, a while that it felt like Silver Lake was just, yeah, that the, mm-hmm. the queerness was being, you know, removed uh, you know, so that these hipster bars or whatever you'd want to call it uh, right. could open. So yeah, that's definitely true. And my and Travis, who lived in Silver Lake and has lived there for a really long time, you know, often remarks that oh, these streets was used to be full of guys cruising, and now it's uh-huh. you know baby strollers. Yeah. Um. So there is that. And you know, we did start a project called the Adonis Project as a reaction when all the bars were closing, like years ago. Okay. Before the ones opened downtown, because mm-hmm. it really felt like queer space was disappearing. Yeah. And so that that project was to call attention to that, and to transform other spaces into queer spaces. But as far as affecting Planet Queer, I don't know. I mean, it always feels like a kind of diverse crowd there too. Like I'm. I, I'm often surprised at how many straight people are there. Like, oh, hi. Right. You know, or allies or whatever. And so, yeah. um, and, you know, we're like an earlier time on a Monday. So it's like eight on Mondays, third Mondays. So, you know, the bar crowd comes after sort of, you know, okay. when we're dancing, you know, like the show's done and then people kind of come in and stuff. You know, they still have their rainbow flag flying and it still feels, you know, like a nice queer presence there. Yeah. Generationally, most people are aware or of gay people and they're moving into the neighborhood and they're aware of, that there is the Eagle still or these right. other bars. So, I mean, and when they changed the Barcito, which was a tragedy because it had a different gay crowd. Yeah. I mean, I think the only other gay crowd that caters to like a Latino gay crowd now is Tiempo, mm-hmm. um, which is down on Western, I believe. Right. Um, uh, I think it's Santa Monica, Santa Monica and, and Western. Western. You're right, yeah. So we lost that space. We, yeah. uh, the other side was just genuine, unique in its own. And I, I, I don't yeah. think we'll get that back. And that was like, you know, catering mostly to like an older gay crowd. Yeah. So it was like sort of, yeah. But the piano bar. 
aspect right. of it was very unique. Yeah, totally. Of its time, I guess. Yeah. I guess now we have karaoke instead. I guess so. <laughs> I know this guy, Jose Promise, was doing piano bar at Akbar for a while. Oh, okay. But now he's doing it in Berlin. Oh. So. You keep bringing up queer, and I want to make sure we get a definition of what you believe the idea of queer is. And I think we've touched on the themes already, but just to get an official sense from you. Oh, yeah. I get, well, I don't know. I, I have sort of an open feeling about what queer means. Um, sort of, uh, I mean, I guess I use it as an umbrella term. Definitely all-inclusive. Right. Sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I've gay. You know, I feel like I'm queer. I'm gay. I'm queer. Mm-hmm. So the LGBTQ, but like in homo allies and, you know, I've definitely, like in, I used to do these get more gay performance workshops. Right. There were people who were like, straight but identified as queer who would be a part of that i do want to bring up your collaboration with travis wood you bring him up as well so he's somebody that you co-produce with so i don't want to i don't want to make it as though only ian does this oh yeah i do know that you're bringing him up so oh yeah totally so how did you meet him what you know i met travis he i think travis had been around in the scene he did he was a big part of dream circus theater that happened mm-hmm. for years and I, I think he was like in a buteau uh dance troupe or still I, he still is so he had been around on the scene for a long time and i know he came to discount cruise shows before i knew him okay. which is kind of funny i became directly aware of him he started performing at queer mondays at highways a mm-hmm. couple of times and uh, i was impressed with his work I, you know, his physical gesture stuff was just strong. And so we bonded a little bit. And then he was around Jean Natalia's wig out that she d- did for a long time. I think she's still doing that. And um, then eventually when Queer Mondays moved or when Queer Mondays ended and Planet Queer started at Akbar, mm-hmm. I was also going to do my solo show and run it um, of part one and two of my solo show, put them together and run it. And he just contacted me and was like, hey, do you need help? I realize you're doing like five shows at once or whatever it was, you know, <laughs> two shows at once. I thought, yeah, actually, I, I need help. <laughs> I do. <laughs> you know, that would really be helpful. And like, can yeah. you do this and this and this? And yeah, and it just, um, it's been a really great partnership. You know, he's like mm. super supportive. And so definitely like he and I run Planet Queer together. How important is it to reach out and ask for help when you have several projects happening. I mean, it, it, I mean he, he, was, he was generous enough to be like, I think he needs some help. But yeah. um, s- since then, have you learned like, hey, every now and then I need to touch base with somebody? Or, <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I, should. It's I o- should. It's always a one-man show. I guess. I don't know. I think, you know, I'm an only child and like oh. I just had to do, you know, it's like to do everything. But no, I mean, there are so many people that make Planet Queer happen. Like David LeBaron mm-hmm. is essential. He's actually had been gone like for the last couple of shows because he was out of town doing like a, sh- a show in New York and mm-hmm. um, something else. The other, I think he was on vacation the other month or something. And it was like, oh my God, I can't do this with, it was so much work without wow. him. Yeah, I just so value what he contributes. And, yeah. you know, Stephen Rains always works the door, which is like invaluable. And we've, you know, we've got a DJ, Billy, and we always have someone running the spotlight. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, and Robert Patrick comes and like helps us set up every time. So yeah, while I'm at the head of it, there's tons of people you yeah. know, making it happen and stuff like that for sure. I think it might be different than the so far. You know, I talk to you know my painter friends mm-hmm. that you know they work alone primarily, and then they put their work up. Or mm-hmm. Trevor, a writer, kind mm-hmm. of you write, maybe you have some editors, but there isn't as much pieces in the art as there is for performance art. Right. So. So for somebody that wants to get into performance art specifically, oh, what, yeah. what, do you, what are some suggestions for anyone that's listening? Oh, just send me a message and say you want to <laughs> perform at Planet Queer. <laughs> I'll be like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think just doing it, you know, I mean, I, in going to see what's out there and see what's going on, you know, mm-hmm. that's great. And there's so many different scenes and people doing stuff like... Um, you know, Gina Young does this thing called Sorority, which is this queer performance event. It's awesome. And mm. um, she's super active. And yeah, I would say meeting people, going to shows, meeting people, um, and then just doing it. Like mm-hmm. I've always been like, book the date, you know, like, right? book it and then create it. You've got to create it now. You know? Yeah. And just, and just saying yes as much as you can to things and right. just, just do everything, you know, and try it out. I definitely feel like deadlines help oh, artists immensely. and creative people kind of 
finally get off their butt and work on something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's like something to live for, something to, you know, focus yeah. on this end, the goal, you know, versus amorphous um, yeah. pieces that might not, you know, form. I think the unconscious needs forms, like, you know, it needs, needs a form. It needs to be out there. Your stuff yeah. needs to be out there, not just in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the world needs it. Yeah, or they won't know that they need it until you put it out there. Yeah. Is that right? If I'm just echoing what you're saying. Sure, yeah. yeah. I know, I think, like, I just think of Martha Graham, who's like, you know, you have your own individual experience, and it's like your duty to share that. Like, no one else can mm -hmm. um, express anything in, in your way. You know, it's your life and soul and your body that can put it out there. I dig that, yeah. So what's been your proudest thing that you've worked on so far? Oh, well, I guess the, the Histology Project, I'm right. probably the most proud of. It was like so researched and, mm -hmm. you know, I wove in my, you know, the issues that I was dealing with personally into it. So it's like this personal, but also historical, but also fun and sexy and campy, you know, it just, mm -hmm. I got to do a lot mm -hmm. in those and tour them around. And yeah, that's probably what I'm most proud of. Okay. What helps you with your discipline to put that work out there? Well, I think what helped was that I was inspired okay. for it. Like the, that, 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 you know, getting turned on by Carl <laughs> and, and feeling like, oh my gosh. And then the, this idea like, oh, I could, you know, I could sleep my way through history and it, it's this whole structure <laughs> and, and it's exciting and it's libidinal and it's liberational and, uh, and, um, and then, yeah, just the more I would like read and learn, the more like turned on I could get, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, I'm inspired to do Michelangelo and the Renaissance and Da Vinci and, and then learning about the Sufis. And mm -hmm. I mean, it just was like, it was like the world opened up. There's this fabulous book by Robert uh, Crompton called uh, Homosexuality and Civilization, which is mm -hmm. like a major source. And I mean, so many sources. Right. Um, yeah. I, th I think that was definitely what did it was like following the inspiration even same with Adonis project what got mm. that underway was that human resources I knew someone who was there Oscar Santos who's wonderful and he was like oh we want a project do you have an idea and I was like oh I don't know I don't really have an idea what should I do like what here's this amazing space and mm. it used to be a movie theater maybe and and then I was like I just had to really tune in like okay what do I like what turns me on? And I thought vintage porn, <laughs> you <laughs> know, shot on film, you know, the bodies that just everything, you know, that, that it's being filmed like at the time of gay liberation. So it has right. that flavor at the time of kind of like psychedelics or influencing art. Right. So it's like that. So it's like, okay, that, and it used to be a theater, you know, theater, human resources, maybe used to be a movie theater. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then this idea that was on everyone's lips in the bars, all the bars are closing, all the bars are closing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, let's take, you know, let's take these things, like what's on people's lips and what's inspiring me and kind of put it together as the themes. Okay. You're also very fortunate in that you fell into such, such a sex positive thing, performance art, so that there was never any, let me put it this way, I, I grew up in a very sex shaming world. Mm, uh -huh. So, and I had to find that world. So it was really nice to see that out there and but it sounds like oh, you, you cool. were you were never really aware that there was sex positive or not you were kind of always do you know get what i'm trying to get at oh. like you're you're in a world that you could just be like yeah gay sex orgy yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess so i mean certainly i grew up in a sex shaming world okay I mean, the world is that way i mean right. in a certain way and certainly you know gay sex shaming way you know that oh yeah you know um I think that I see gay sex and liberation as like really connected. Okay. And right. gay spirit as really connected with gay sex and libido, mm -hmm. that the turn on um, is what's making all of those things happen. Like they have the same source. So connecting them just felt right. And, you know, I think performance art on a certain level lends itself to, you know, sexual expression as well. Right. Well, let's get into which artist you f you're keeping your eye on nowadays. Oh, <laughs> I'm all Maria Montez or something. <laughs> I'm like watching old 40s musicals uh -huh. or something or, uh, you know, Reg Park from the her old uh, Hercules films in the 60s of the artist. Um, no, let's see. There are some great artists right now. Martin Matamoros is really an amazing. Do you know okay. Martin? Yeah. Uh, Asher. 
Uh-huh. Formerly Rich. Yeah. The artist formerly known as Rich. Oh, I love I miss I miss I haven't met Asher yet, actually. I haven't, I haven't seen him since the He officially called me as Asher like a month ago. So oh, cool. Cool. I know it's like only been in like uh conversations like this where it comes up that I've like, oh yeah, you know, Asher. I say Asher and then you know, we make the adjustment. Mm. You know Martin through through Asher. Yeah. But go ahead and describe oh, yeah. what, what Martin, you like about Martin's work. Oh my work, gosh. Or... Martin's work is so excellent. I mean, Martin what's he is just very uh particular and very fine artist. You know what I mean? Like he's okay. precise and it's rehearsed and he mm-hmm. works hard, I guess is what I'm saying. He mm-hmm. works, he pours a lot of energy and libido into his work, not only his stage work, but he does amazing visual art and, uh, and writes plays. And so I think Martin is always someone to be watching and see, seeing what he's, you know, what he's cooking up. Right. Cause it's going to be quality. It's going to be, um, gay and queer. It's going to, you know, have some a lot of heart in it. Okay. There was the villains thing. Mm-hmm. I think you were part of that? Or? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. He did that at Highways. That was a right. fun one. Okay. Yeah, he has a show called Gentleman, which is um, a gay male adaptation of the movie The Women. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, that all-woman all, all woman movie. And so many. He just did like a Pinocchio play right. at the Lyric Theater. Went over so well. Yeah. And was so fun. Very moving. And... Um, and so creative. Yeah, he's got yeah. an Alice in Wonderland show. I mean, he's just got so much. Yeah. Yeah. And I have no problem making the compliment that, like, even when I'm not in the mood to do something creative, it's always just fun to go out and watch someone else that's doing something. You know, that's why that's why I've seen a lot of your stuff and I go to oh, readings. Yeah. And, you know, even if it's just, like, not happening for me. Uh-huh. And I want to encourage anyone else that's listening to just go out there, like, once a month or every three months. Yeah. I mean, you're someone who's constantly creating stuff. So for you, it's... You know, it's probably not even something to think about, but there are probably other people that are driving in their car right now and, you know, look something up in your area and go check it out, right? Yeah, go out, get inspired, Mm -hmm. you know, get turned on, you know, (laughs) check out what's happening, get judgmental, whatever whatever (laughs) needs to come out, you know. Be hateful on on Twitter. Right, yeah, exactly. You can dish about the artists and... Um, you know, it's all it's all part of it. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. It is. Um, and is there any anybody currently that's inspiring you besides Martin? Like just even like music, oh. uh, TV, movies? Huh. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm into Caitlin Aurelia Smith. I don't know if you know her music. She's no. so interesting and fun. I got to see her at... Uh, at like Union Station. She played a show wow. at Union Station. We like took the train that. down there and saw her. And it's she uses all this like vintage um electronic mm-hmm. music to create sort of these ambient but experimental stuff. It's I it's beautiful to listen to, very creative. Mm-hmm. So that's I guess what I'm listening to musically. And Abra, I kinda like her. Um she's just so soulful okay. in her voice. But I mean, there are so many interesting queer artists that inspire me. The Mego Man is amazing. ODSRE is amazing. Um, I mean, I could go on and on. Of I mean, course. the Planet Queer is such a a hotbed of rare birds right. and and people who are you know just real people like mining their own unconscious for these this creative gold, and they put it on stage, and it works, and it doesn't work, and it's everything, and it, it mostly works. It's wonderful. Mm. So yeah. that that really inspires me. It's just okay. getting to see people up there doing their thing. Right. You know, I, I much prefer like a, a real raw untrained perf- I mean, I, I respect trained performances too, all of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I just love the queerness on stage. And that's <laughs> definitely something that, that, again, when I brought up the word frontline, that you're seeing a lot of stuff passing through and mm-hmm. you're, you're kind of raw beginnings of, of a lot of artists. So, yeah. 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 I love seeing that too. Like so many people like the Mego man, like, I mean, he's always been like a great artist and stuff, but I think he hadn't had like put it on the back burner and then uh-huh. started getting into planet queer and, and doing that more. And now he does his own show called medicine, mm-hmm. which happens on the new moon, um, a, f- a number of times a year. And there's just been a number of people like that who have like gotten inspired at, at planet queer or reconnected to their creativity and then go off and do their own thing, do their mm-hmm. own shows, stuff like that. All right. I think we covered a lot of the topics here. Okay. And if there's anything else we want to get back into later, we can. Okay. Um, so I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having and, me. And uh, go ahead and uh, let anybody know, like, any of the Facebook or how to find you. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, there's planetqueer.org. Planetqueer.org. Um, so you know about that. It's always Planet Queer is on the third Monday of the month at Akbar in Silver Lake. 
And uh, yeah, you could message me on Facebook or Instagram, Ian McKinnon, and mm-hmm. and say hi. That'd be awesome. Any other up- upcoming things that people should know about? Well, Planet Queer Big Bang is taking place November 20th. That's uh-huh. the last show of the year. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be awesome. We're going to be doing a play um, as a part of it as well. There's All a group right. performance piece that I'm uh, in and directing with, with uh, some people. It should be awesome. Very cool. Well, if you're in the area, come and check it out. And thanks again for being on the show, Ian. Sure, anytime. Thanks for listening to Never Meet Your Heroes podcast. Find us at nevermeetyourheroespodcast.com where you can post comments, ask questions, and interact with artists and listeners. Also, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe.